Jamal, what do you think of a venture firm making a seed investment at a hundred million, then a billion, then at four billion for a product that you know is largely sideways? It, 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 this is like internal three bets and marking it up ten x and then four x, so forty x lift over three rounds. What do we think of this? I think the best venture firms shouldn't give a shit about any company, and I don't think that they really do. Because if they're very savvy, they should be doing exactly what Andreessen, um, you've seen the articles about Tiger, you've seen all these other folks. The real question is maybe if you want, can you please explain what they're doing? And uh, what they're doing is, to me, if you understand, the investing landscape makes a ton of sense, which is technology used to be the small niche and so we used to only get, you know, when I started social capital, there was probably 25 to $30 billion a year flowing into venture just in 2011. Fast forward a decade, we have like $120 billion a year going into tech and it's going up like crazy. And if you're the best brands, you're going to get the overwhelming amount of interest from people who want to get into the asset class as the asset class expands, right? So if all of a sudden, you know, you decided to invest in private equity when private equity was going bonkers, you're not going to take as much of a shot on an emerging manager, you're going to want to take a shot on Blackstone or KKR, right? And that's what's allowed those folks, Carlisle, to scale AUM just unbelievably. Blackstone, I Assets think, is past under half a, management. Exactly, half a trillion dollars now at Blackstone. Similarly, there are these indelible brands in venture. And when everybody realizes they need to be long tech, they jump in. Now, when they do that, you have to understand who these people are. There are two things that matter. One, they are people like pension funds. And their hurdle rate, meaning, you know, what are they trying to do better than in terms of a, of a rate of return is in the low to mid single digits. That's really important to know. 9%, 10%. Not even, what not, the even stock not even, not even. 5%, 6%. Okay. And then the second thing you need to know is that these guys have so much money that they would rather when they spend an hour meeting with you, they'd rather give you a $50 million check than a $5 million check. A $5 million check just compounds their problems. So if you put these two things together, it makes a ton of sense for companies like Andreessen to now focus on the velocity of money, raise a fund, put the money to work, raise a new fund in a very systematic way that everybody can understand and can predict. So that Andreessen can tell their LPs on a calendar, guys, I'm going to be back to you in 18 months. Guys, I'm going to be back to you in a year and be able to scale the capital. And I think if you, if you look at it in that framework, it explains Andreessen, it explains Excel, it explains Sequoia. And by the way, it's a brilliant strategy because these guys still make two and a half percent on the money. They end up returning the market beta, meaning what the average market would do anyways, plus a little bit of alpha, right? So they'll still do a little bit better than the market, which means they'll be able to raise money infinitely. So if I'm do you mean the and I've had a public it, market or the venture market, so venture market, no, venture market, does venture, venture market, no, but that'll decay, right? So that'll decay down to the to to 10% or 12%. But my point is, it's still better than the five or 6% these pension funds and other folks need to earn. So today, the goal of every fund that's successful that has a brand, David's included, should be do good deals, make sure you're in things that, that can work. And the thing that David has, which other folks don't, is David can help make things work when they're not necessarily obvious, but then pound the money in and then raise more money as fast as you can. Because then, you know, it helps the investor, that's what they want, and they're happy to pay you. And then for you, the GP, you start to make enormous fees and the whole cycle works. Um, so for Andreessen, I think that's the calculus. It's like, shit, if I can put 100 million in, that's 100 million less I have in my fund. Now I can go, I'm 100 million closer to raising the new fund. Okay, now the criticism has been, Friedberg, I'll go to you. It's bad hygiene for the same firm to mark up the same product three times. In this case, you know. Um, Clubhouse. What's in it? Clubhouse. So is that a warning sign for you that it's a bubble or it's kind of the, the worst case I've heard is like marking up your own book, self dealing, whatever. How do you look at that issue, Freeberg? And then I'll go to you, Sex. Well, if it were SpaceX, 
you would look like a genius. So, you know, I think we can criticize it until or WhatsApp we know, or WhatsApp. And Sequoia has done this many times where they've been the lead in multiple rounds in the company and they have high conviction in the quality of a business and they don't want to bring other investors in. And when you have high conviction and you can continuously buy more of the stock and buy more of the company and be a bigger owner, and then it works out, you look like a freaking genius. And so I don't want to criticize the investing style of these guys. I mean, time will tell if they made good bets or not as a whole. You can kind of make the case maybe that they're trying to be asset managers and drive assets under management up and gain more fees. But I think LPs are a little shrewder than that. They'll kind of take a smarter look at that. At the end of the day, the guys that are known for doing this, like Sequoia and Founders Fund and others, have had incredible returns by doing exactly this. So the strategy does work. And um, you know, you just have to have to do it with the right businesses. And that I think that will, you know, demonstrate the quality of your investing acumen. All right, Sachs, any further thoughts on that? The marking up your own book? Is that something you plan on doing with this new fund and having the growth? And how would you look at, hey, call in starts getting some traction? Does that mean your growth fund is going to go market up and take that those shares? Or do you think that it's better hygiene to have the market price it? Well, I guess it just depends. I mean, the growth fund does give us the ability to double down at a later stage on our own early stage companies. But you do have to be really sure when you do that, because it does, you know, it, it certainly raises questions if you're wrong, right, that you wouldn't have with any other investment. So it just it definitely raises the stakes. You have to be really certain, I guess. But, you know, if Colin's a big hit, do we go raise, you know, a growth round? Yeah. And now I think what we might do in that case, because we incubated it, is we'd let somebody else lead the round and then we would participate. So you have some third party setting the price because we incubated the company. And frankly, that's what we did with the round that you just participated in is Kraft participated, but we did not set the terms. It was actually uh, Goldcrest and Sequoia co-led the round with craft when you incubate a company like that let me ask another technical question because uh, the audience last week or and the week before really responded well to us talking about this as opposed to COVID and delta variant uh, which we'll talk about at the end of the show for those people you can basically turn off the show at 50 minutes or <laughs> 75 <laughs> minutes when we talk about the impact of the pandemic but uh and, I, and i'm hoping you're thinking right now about who's not in italy i hope we'll get back to that at the end <laughs> When you incubate a company like that, who owns the original founder shares? Kraft, the organization, David Sachs, the individual came up with it. What's the inside baseball there? So it's sort of all of the above. And uh, we, meaning Kraft, uh, have a deal with our LPs that's called an LPA, Limited Partner Agreement. And one of the things that was negotiated when I founded Kraft four years ago was the terms on which Kraft would incubate deals. and. Um, and so it's all predetermined what I get as a founder, what, what our funds get, what the LPs get. So there can be no argument about it later. And uh, this is this, uh, call it, it well, we, we've actually done now, we have a few incubations in development. You know, for me, it's really important to, to scratch that product itch. You know, I'm originally a product guy and, um, and I, you know, I, I love investing in helping companies, but occasionally about, I'd say maybe once a year, I get a, a product idea that I think is worth developing. And so this gives us the ability to incubate it. So we did it a few years ago with a crypto company called Harbor. We ended up selling that company to BitGo, which just announced a, the largest uh, acquisition of a crypto company. Uh, Galaxy is acquiring it for something like $1.2 billion. So anyway, so Harbor, I think, um, will work out, uh, you know, once that deal closes. And Colin's the second one. There's a couple other things that are still, you know, they're too early to talk about. But, um, but I think Colin will be the, the second one to, to launch. Chamath, as an LP and a lot of funds, what do you think when somebody comes to you and says, I want to, in my LPA, my limited partner agreement, have the ability to incubate these companies? Is that a good trend, bad trend? How do you think about it? I think it's great. I mean, I don't really, you know push back on a single term in any LPA because I'm only doing it mostly to support people. And so whatever terms they want, they get from me. And, uh, you know, kind of just like let them go and hope they get lucky. You know, I have a very different approach to, to these kinds of things because I'm not necessarily trying to compound my capital. I'm just there to sort of enable folks and, you know, take 1% of the fund or sometimes a little bit more if I really 
have an asymmetric view on a specific thing that they're doing, but otherwise I just take 1%, sign the thing and, you know, wish them, wish them the best and then try to support them. And that's all I'm trying to do. If I believe in what, how they're investing and the deals they've done, uh, you know, however they do it is up, is fine with me. I want to go back to something which is, I actually think it's not a question of hygiene. It's really a question of governance because when you do these things and you mark these companies up, the real question, if a company stops working is they tend to have too much money and then they tend to not have enough governance. And the reason is because governance typically comes with board diversity and board diversity comes with more and different investors who have different, you know, uh, puts and takes uh, at any given point in time. That diversity is very helpful to keep everybody on the same page and to actually get a decent outcome when things aren't working as much. Now, when things are working, obviously nobody cares, you know, because like you can just have Jim Getz on the board of WhatsApp with Jan and it's all kind of said and done. It's um, not been to Brian. the right. So as we're saying, when things are when things are good, nobody complains. Yeah. No, and you know, this may be a good jumping off point for uh, you know, we wanted to talk about Zymergen today. Can I say one thing before we get to Zymergen, which is just yeah. look, I think there's all sorts of new models now with with just sort of tech and the money going into tech, the venture capital exploding. There's all these innovative new models, and I think it's all for the good. A studio that I think is great is uh what um uh Jack Abraham's done with Atomic. You know, they've produced multiple unicorns out of there because Jack is just a phenomenal idea guy. He's like a 10x idea guy. So he then, as part of Atomic, comes up with the idea and then brings on an operating partner and that model works for them. And then, you know, he just partnered with Keith Raboy on Open Store, and Keith decided to become the CEO and Keith is still a GP at Founders Fund. So we're seeing like the blending of these models. You know, it used to be that you made the decision to become a VC and your career as a founder was just over. It was like this line that could never be crossed again. And now you're seeing the blurring of these lines. And look, I think it's good for everybody because frankly, when, you know, Keith or, you know, what I'm doing with Colin, we remind people that we're still founders and product people and, you know, not just sort of semi-retired guys. And frankly, it's like, it's good for what we do as investors. I mean, we saw it with uh, Mike Spicer, who is a partner at Sutter Hill. He incubated, started, and was the original uh, head of Snowflake, uh, which was a massive... But, and before that, he's, this is his third. So, you know, right. he did Pure Storage. He did Snowflake. I think he did Laceworks. Incredible. Um, he's incredible. He's just incredible. fucking money. And he's just, money. Just, just folks that don't know, Snowflake, you know, it's an enterprise software company. They make software. So, he's a venture capitalist. He started this company while working as a venture capitalist. They brought on a great CEO, this incredible guy later, who's who, Frank Flutman, who's, who's a legend. And the company just went public last year, I think, or the year before, and they're worth $82 billion today. Um, and so it really highlights that while this guy is still operating as a venture capitalist and a GP, he's been able to generate incredible returns for his fund um, and, and build amazing businesses at the same time. So, I mean, Spicer, Spicer is a perfect example because I... I've known him since like the early 2000s. And at one point, Spicer started this um, consumer company called Bix. And I was like, a, we were like an investor. I was a small investor in Bix. And, uh, and it got, a, I think it got acquired by Yahoo. And it was always curious because like Spicer was clearly the smartest one in the room. And it's like, he was kind of grinding this consumer thing. And then he left Yahoo, went to Sutter Hill. And he basically said, you know what, fuck this. I'm going back to my roots. Because before that, he was, a pretty traditional enterprise guy, and he just crushed it. It's kind of like Michael Jordan was finally like, ah, fuck baseball. I'm going back to basketball. And, but it's, uh, like, it's like Reed Hoffman incredible. and Neil Boosery at Greylock, right? I mean, these guys yeah. are incredible operators, business builders, and they continue to, to do that work while uh, while being partners in the venture room. 